So you've just raised a seed round. Congratulations, this is awesome. Now the question is, how do you actually get to the next stage of growth? What does raising a Series A today in 2020 and beyond, what does that actually entail? In this video, I'm gonna walk you through the three principles you absolutely need to know to navigate the path to raising a Series A next. Intro. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Unstoppable. I'm TK, and on this channel, I help SaaS founders like you navigate the path to the next stage of growth with an unstoppable strategy. If you are new to this channel, I drop an episode like this every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. So be sure to hit the subscribe button and that bell icon so you get notified when I drop an episode with the TK Energy. Also, if you are already part of my SaaS Go to Market program, if you're part of this channel, welcome back. It's really great to see you here. Now, in this episode, if you've already raised the seed round, what does it take to navigate the path the next 12 months, the next 24 months, so that you can set yourself up for success and get to a Series A? Now, I will say, I saw a report recently, and the report said that only 4% of companies that actually raise a seed round go on to raise a Series A, which means that the failure rate of seed-based companies are actually quite high. There's more seed investors here today than ever before, more seed companies getting than ever before, but the success rate of them getting to a Series A is actually quite low. So I wanted to dig into exactly what you can do to optimize that path. Now, I know what you're thinking. You might be wondering, TK, the last time you raised a Series A was like 2014. What do you know about raising a Series A today in 2020 or beyond or in the next couple of years? You're right, you're 100% right. My knowledge is probably a little bit dated on this, which is why I decided to hit up a couple of friends. The first person I hit up that you'll hear from is Ben Horowitz. Ben Horowitz is obviously a Series A investor of Andreessen Horowitz. They did our Series B. So I hit him up on, hey, what do you think about raising a Series A today? I also hit up Greg Gretsch and Josh Breinlinger of Jackson Square Ventures. They actually did our Series A. So I hit them up on, hey, what does it take to raise a Series A today? And lastly, I happen to be on a call with my friend, Nikul Mandan. He has done enterprise B2B SaaS for the last 10 years. He was one of eight GPs at Lightspeed. And I was like, hey dude, I'm doing an episode on raising a series A. Do you mind if I hit the record button and ask you a few questions? So you'll, you'll hear from him as well. So if you're excited to dig in the three principles on how to actually make sure you can raise a series A, go ahead and smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm and let's dig right into it. Okay, so the first person I hit up was Ben Horowitz. He's like the most legit investor that I know, incredible person, a mentor to me. And I asked, hey Ben, if there's like this one liner thing you would give on what it takes to raise a series A today, what would that be? And I knew I could count on Ben to actually give this one liner. It would either be the best epic set of rap lyrics, or it would be this one liner that would just perfectly capture what it actually takes to raise series A. And he didn't disappoint, he wrote in, to be series A ready, you need to make real progress traveling down the path from a good idea to a great business. From a good idea to a great business. And he's like, is that okay? Is that good for a one liner? I'm like, dude, that is perfect. And that goes into principle number one. Okay, so principle number one is if you've raised a pre-seed, it was probably over a good idea. If you've raised a seed, you, you probably have some semblance of a product. Over some semblance of a product, you've raised the seed. Now, in order to raise a series A, you need to show how far and how much progress you've actually made after that seed that you've raised, after you put that money to work, to take that product and to turn it into a great business. And it could be over here, and you'll hear, you'll hear this from some of the other people that I asked. It doesn't necessarily have to be absolutely a great business. You'll notice Ben's quote, Ben said, it has to be progress towards a great business from a good idea. So anywhere in this spectrum that you can get into, in terms of showing the progress towards a great business, that's when you start to become Series A ready. Now, that's a good start, right? Like that's a good start, like you're going from the idea phase to like, hey, is there a business here? Can you actually close deals, right? So I wanted to dig in a little bit more, even more. And so that's when I hit up Greg Gretsch and Josh Beinlinger, they're at Jackson Square Ventures. Now, Jackson Square did our Series A. They're an incredible firm. In fact, they've backed companies including DocuSign, Responses, and even Seismic, which is an incredible company right now. 
And so they know B2B SaaS, they understand what it takes to build enterprise companies, and they specialize in investing around the Series A stage. That's when they invested in us. So when I hit up, so I hit up both of them because Greg was on my board and I've quoted him a bunch of times and incredible advice he's given me as I navigated my startup journey. So I said, hey Greg, I'm doing this episode on raising a Series A, what does that look like? Give me the one liner, I'd love to like quote you on it. And he said, this was over text, he's like, look, these days, Series A is all about early product market fit. You have to be able to show that someone cares about what you're building. Right? It's simple. This builds on Ben's thing on, look, you're making forward progress towards a great business. How do we know that? Well, Greg highlights it right away, which is you, you need to show some level of product market fit. Now, as founders, we know conceptually that we got to chase product market fit. I talk about it on this episode about the Shawshank crawl to product market fit. But product market fit is one of the greatest proxies that Series A investors use to understand how much closer have you gotten from just a product idea to a great business? So when you think about product market fit, which Greg outlines, product market fit is the early predictor of a great business. Now, Josh, who's Greg's partner, he's also a, a partner of the firm, he dug in a little bit more. He said, okay, seed is often before product market fit, right? That we all get that. Series A investors want to see strong product market fit. And Josh is awesome because he always digs into specifics and metrics like he's that kind of guy and he's like super smart about that so he went in and like look that's reflected in unit economics annual growth rate and most importantly net spend retention or at least customer satisfaction so i'll dig into these a little bit more investors need to believe that you'll be able to continue to grow the business in a very fast healthy and scalable way I thought this was awesome. It goes into some of these core metrics that you obviously want to be tracking. You definitely want to be tracking right after you raise your seed round and you want to be optimizing for it. They include your unit economics. They include your customer satisfaction uh, score. Obviously, you want to start driving growth, but probably one of the most important metrics, and we talk about this on this channel, is your net dollar retention, right? Net retention means that even if you're churning logos or number of customers, the ones that stay, end up spending more and more and more and more cohort after cohort after cohort and time period after time period after time period. And that's what one of the things that Josh was highlighting. And that's super important because that goes into the quality of the business that you're building. We'll talk about a little, little bit more about that in the next principle that Nicole will go into. But that talks about the quality of your SaaS business. It's not just about growth, 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 growth. It's also about the quality. And some of these metrics are the ones that, uh, that investors will look at to understand what is the quality and are you getting towards a great business and do, are you starting to get product market fit? So principle one and two, principle one, as Ben said, are you getting closer? How much progress have you made to building a great business versus just an idea and a product? And number two, the proxy that investors look at is like, well, let's gauge product market fit. And these are some of the metrics they start to look at. Now, before I go into principle number three, which digs into this a little bit more, even more, let me just pause here for a second. This is something that I truly believe. As a Sara founder, you have two levers. You're either shipping code or you're closing deals. Ship code, close deals. Ship code, close deals. In the seed stage and the pre-seed stage, there's a lot that you're doing in terms of shipping code. But the sooner you start to operate the other lever, the sooner you're gonna start to actually turn your idea into a real business, and you're gonna be able to actually drive towards product market fit and get these metrics and optimize for these metrics that investors really care about. Too often I see founders over index on building and building, building product, 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 and not enough on distribution, not enough on go-to-market. SaaS businesses are built on three pillars. The first is market, the second is product, and the third is go-to-market. And if anything, even out of these two principles and these amazing investors, what you're really learning is you gotta optimize for those things. You gotta be able to ship code and close deals. You gotta optimize for the market and go-to-market, which is your distribution and also your product. Are you starting to get this? If you are, go ahead and smash that like button if you haven't already for the YouTube algorithm. Comment below with your thoughts and let's go into principle number three. Principle number three, in order to get into this, I, I was on a call with Nicole. Nicole is an incredible investor. He had sourced the growth deal for Marketo. He had done uh, Gainsight, uh, he had sourced that. He uh, did people.ai, 
He was one of eight GPs at Lightspeed. Lightspeed is an incredible B2B enterprise investment firm. He did Series A deals there, and now he's opened up his own firm called Audacious Ventures. So when I was on a call with him, I'm like, and also, the, the, here's the backstory on Nicole. I was on the other side of a due diligence with him. He was looking, he was working at uh, one another venture firm who was looking at our Series A, and he did our due diligence, and I, I got to go head to head with this guy. He was an associate back then, and I was like, Oh my God, like this guy's thorough. He knows his shit when it comes to B2B enterprise SaaS. So I had to ask him, hey, for our Series A, what does that look like? So we're gonna dig into that. Let's switch over to our Zoom call. Hi, I'm Nakul Mandan. I'm the founder and GP of Audacious Ventures, uh, where I'm looking to find the next great SaaS company. So the big question is, uh, for a SaaS founder that has raised the seed round, now they have this ticking time clock and they wanna get to the Series A. So the big question is, what does a founder need to think about to get to that A? As a Series A investor, what do you look for? I think there's an overemphasis in the Twitter sphere, the blogger sphere of like the 1 million in ARR milestone or 2 million in ARR. I, I think people overemphasize on that, but really a Series A is still selling the dream and a lot of the qualitative factors matter much more than the quantitative factors. I've seen companies with 2 million in ARR struggle uh, to raise a good Series A and I've seen companies with 400K of ARR or, or even like less sometimes raise a meaningful size Series A. And also the nomenclature has changed. There are $6 million Series A's, there are $20 million Series A's. So ultimately the way I think about it is you uh, at the Series A stage, it's typically a post-product launch company. There's some traction and yes, those metrics matter, but what really matters is the qualitative side of the story. How big is the dream? Um, what's the competitive landscape? Are you re really sustainably different? And then in terms of the metrics, it's really, it, what is the quality of revenue that has come through? Uh, and what I mean by that is the quality of logos, the logo velocity, the engagement with which those you, uh, customers or users are engaging with you. What matters the most is the repeatability. Is that right? Like tell us. Yeah, I'd say um, because ultimately you are selling a dream and you say, I have 1 million in ARR, let's say, right? Yeah. Uh, but investors are not investing so that you can go from one to five. It's more like, is this a motion that now can be made repeatable so that you can go from one to five, five to 15, 15 to 35 or whatever, right? And so, um, so they're really looking for, are there enough signals for me to extrapolate this to a longer journey? Right. And so as an example, one aspect of repeatability that is often not talked about enough by founders and pitches is that these 17 customers all bought for the same use case, the use case instantly connected, right? If the 17 customers, five are using for one use case, another five for another use case, the conclusion that somebody might draw from that is that this is a cool technology. It hasn't nailed the use case yet. Yep. Um, and that's fine, but it does impact then how you think of repeatability and accordingly your check size exposure to a CDZ. And then it goes back to what I thought was fascinating was that you have that 2 million ARR company couldn't get a deal done, but the 400K ARR company did get a deal done. And really it's the quality of the message and the revenue and the product that they sold and the type of customers that you're seeing consistency yeah. in that. And that's what really gets a deal done. Yeah, I think an investor is really looking to extrapolate that if I invested, invest here, how, how big can this be? And some signal of repeatability. Again, I will say like market size, the, the dream, sustainable advantages, those qualitative factors cannot be underrated in a, a series A story. But to the extent the metrics matter, it's the repeatability of the metrics than the absolute 400k versus 2 million. To the extent repeatability matters, also what matters is, is there already a team in-house who can actually make that repeatability happen on the Google market side? Right? No yeah, and I think with the, with a first-time founder, it's especially hard. Like I remember when I was a first-time founder raising, um, like what you want is that growth engine and the growth team. Yeah. And that gets you the series A. And, but in order to get the growth machine, you need to get the growth people, but great growth people are attracted to the beginnings of a great growth machine. So there's a chicken and egg problem. Yeah, absolutely. And series A founders are attracted to a growth machine and kind of a promising team. So they'll say, okay, maybe like you have a director, not a VP as, as you might've mentioned before. 
there's a chicken and egg there. How do you, how do you, what, how have you seen the best first time founders navigate that path? I mean, it's really, really tough, by the way, uh, because of exactly what you said. The founder's job partly is to sell the dream, not just to investors, to potential hires. I would argue that selling to potential hires is tougher and more important than selling to investors, right? right? If you can get eight plus people in your team, the investor side will come. Yeah, uh, It's tougher to though, hire the eight plus people. And that means identification and then judging and closing those people. So to summarize what you said, it's about getting the initial mar- go to market going, getting that up and comer on, showing that you're able to close deals and showing that it's quality deals. You're selling a consistent use case, consistent customer types. Yeah. And that sets you up on saying, hey, if we have more capital then we would be able to scale this and yeah. there's a bigger market opportunity, which is the dream versus just the numbers. And then you can go from there. Uh, absolutely. And- How much of this is uh, very much, at least from the founders that you've invested in versus not invested in. One of the big things I learned, like I, I've, I'm a computer science guy. Uh, I majored mm-hmm. in computer science. I coded the first version of the product. I learned that in order to really make any of this work, to be able to recruit that great sales and marketing leader, I needed to embrace sales and marketing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how much of that have you seen as necessary versus not? Uh, it is necessary in my limited view. Um, I'd say, um, you know, ultimately the way I think about it is um, I want to invest in founders who will be obsessed with product and then post product market fit, they'll be obsessed with distribution. Right. So you need both. It's not an or strategy. It's an and strategy. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. This is awesome. Yeah. So as you start to pick up from all four of these incredible series, a investors and incredible investors, just period for B2B SaaS, what you're starting to learn, if you're starting to see some patterns is that you got to move from just a product idea to a great business. But the best way that investors gauge that is to look at product market fit and they look at certain metrics to do that. But even more so, as Nicole pointed out, it's not just about the revenue that you put on, it's about the quality of the revenue. So if you've got a product and you're going after a market, it's the quality of that go-to-market machine. Specifically, it's looking at, are you, do you have a consistent use case you're selling? Specifically, it's about, do you have a consistent process, consistent type of customers? Because then they'll look at, all these guys will look at it and say, okay, if we were to put in more money into this, would we be able to scale this faster? Is there a real business to go after? Is there a bigger dream to go after? And that's the real power in this. So what, what happens when you tie this all together? My view on this is that to get from that seed stage to that series A, to be part of that small percentage of startups that raise a seed round and then graduate to a series A, it's go time on your go-to-market machine. That's the biggest thing you wanna be thinking about. You wanna actually think about how to build a go- differentiated go-to-market machine. You wanna think about how to, you can't just outsource marketing and sales. You need to own it as a founder and you need to figure out how you can drive that distribution. Now, if you're a SaaS founder and you're driving to that next stage of growth and you're thinking about how to build a differentiated go-to-market machine, what I'd encourage you to do is download my five-point startup growth strategy guide. Inside of that guide, I give you the key things that you need to actually think through to create this one-page strategy that actually articulates how you're gonna grow over the next 12 months and 24 months so that you can go to that next stage of growth, you can raise that Series A, you can build a bigger business. You can download that by following the link below or just go to getunstoppable.com slash strategy. Also, if you are hyper-focused on building a go-to-market machine, your differential go-to-market machine, I know this really well. This, this topic is near and dear to my heart. And this is why I created my SaaS go-to-market coaching program. Inside of this program, we actually help you hone in on your ICP, we hone in on your manifesto, and we actually hone in on your Broadway show. These are three things that are super important in building a differentiated go-to-market machine. So if you wanna learn more about that, go to tkkato.com slash GTM. I'll also link to it below. So that's all I have for you today. Hopefully you got value. If you did, be sure to smash that like button. I drop a video like this every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. So be sure to hit the subscribe button, that bell icon. If there's specific topics you want me to cover and dig more into, specific people you want me to go hit up, be sure to put that in the comments below or just email me. If you have a friend that would get value from this video, please share it with them. It will mean the world to us. And lastly, remember, everyone needs a strategy for their life and their business, but when you are with us, Yours is going to be unstoppable. I'm TK. 
and I'll see you in the next episode.